Hello, I'm Tim Weaving, a PhD student at University College London, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to the 30th instalment in Comp Biomed's e-seminar series in collaboration with the Virtual Physiological Human Institute, or VPHI. This project is funded via the EU Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme with grant number 823712, for which we are very grateful. The talk today is going to be given by Kristen Merritt, Chief Marketing Officer for ALSA's Flight, with over 15 years experience in enterprise technology and over seven in high performance computing, delivering complex projects and helping clients in balancing platforms, tools and technology to make their projects successful. Kristen also volunteers regularly within the HPC community, serving, for example, in the capacity as fundraiser and social media editor for women in HPC and social media editor for the supercomputing conference series. Today, she's going to talk with us about Nucleus. That's with a capital UCL, um, an educational framework for HPC, but also a template for approaching projects that change platforms and users given changing demand. Now, before we begin, I'd like to briefly remind you that the session is being recorded um, and is going to be available on the Quant Biomed website and YouTube channel shortly. So please do use this um, to go back over parts of today's talk and others in the series, uh, and maybe even share these e-seminars with your friends and colleagues. There's going to be a Q&A session at the very end of the talk, um, so please do save your questions until then. Once the talk is finished, you can go ahead and post your questions in the Ask the Staff question panel, um, which should be accessible via the question mark icon on your screen, and I will read them out to Kristen to keep the session running smoothly. Um, now that's enough from me. I very much hope that you enjoyed today's talk. And finally, Kristen, uh, please feel free to go ahead and take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. You can hear me okay? Sounds good to me. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. My name is Kristen Merritt. I am the CMO at ALSA's Flight, and I'm here to talk to you today about Nucleus, which is creating and running a successful, adaptable, portable HPC education environment. So just a little bit about who I am. So my name, again, is Kristen. Um, I've been with ALSA's for almost seven years. Uh, I started out as a, what did I start out as, as? oh my goodness, a partner manager. Um, and I uh, ascended up through program management, which Nucleus was one of my first large scale projects. And then today, which I run all of the communication side as a CMO. So I look after the stories, business cases, and the business side. And so I kind of wanted to preface that this talk is a little bit less about the technology and a little bit more about the types of people and the types of things you need to do to get a successful project, especially one in high performance computing off the ground. So I'm going to take you back. Oh, before I take you back, I need to thank a bunch of people. There's actually a lot more involved in, in uh, what became of Team Nucleus, as we like to call ourselves. The UCL, University of Sheffield, and the ALSA's flight teams came together on this. Um, had none of these people uh, come in, I don't think we would have been a success. So thank you to all of them. Um, and here we go. ALSA's flight. What are we? So the short of it is, is we're HPC integrators. As HPC integrators, I like to say we're the glue that holds HPC together, although it's more like a kind of a blue tack. It comes off the walls and things get changed around. But that's a hard thing to like kind of get across to people. What we do is we build and manage and grow HPC solutions, um, primarily cloud native these days, because that's in high demand. In fact, it ties all the way back to this project Nucleus and the idea of portable cloud. With ALSA's flight and where we sit within the Comp Biomed facility, we're um, associate partners, um, we are considered vendors, and so when we were approached and engaged on this project, we did so understanding that this would have an educational benefit for all those involved. So it was great fun to be part of it. Now I'll finally take you back, I don't know why I was getting so ahead of myself, to March of 2020 when it was the worst of times and the worst of times. So um, not that anyone needs to be reminded, but there was a bit of a pandemic that had hit in March of 2020 and it changed about everything there was to know about everything that anyone was doing everywhere, including education. And so CombioMed actually has an education component. It's one of the larger components um, that was at least part of the first and second version of uh, CombioMed. And there is an absolute need and drive and desire to get people involved in the facilities, get people involved in high performance computing. And with the pandemic, all of a sudden, the idea of how to educate just sort of got thrown out the window because the students went from being in specific sites or at least getting to a specific site to suddenly being distributed. 
there was a lot of virtual learning that had been untested at scale. I um, will readily admit I experienced this firsthand uh, when I went from someone who was not only working in high-performance computing and working with clients, but also teaching at the time an eight-year-old son. Um, thankfully, I, he was within the uh, range of things that I could understand, but I could not even fathom what it would be like to get to the scale of education that is needed, especially for advanced degrees. And finally, the resources were nebulous, especially with um, high performance computing resources. There were there are ways and means that you get access to these resources. And at the time, it's not that case anymore, thankfully. There was a lot of like certain ways and certain places you had to be and certain means by which you could get access to these resources and to pull them together in time to get people on boarded in time. It, there was a big, big rush. And so things had to be prioritized. And as all of you probably on the call realize, that also a high performance computing was heavily, heavily used in order to figure out the answer or the means and means to tackle the COVID-19 crisis. So resources were also stretched on that front as well. So what happened? I was very, very lucky to get in touch with Andrew Townsend Nicholson, who had this dilemma as she was running this course, it was for medical students, on the CHIME 2 application. Her aim, um, as she likes to kind of tell people, is to sort of get people into what she calls cross-pollinated degrees. So go out, sprinkle computing knowledge into biologists, into medical students, into clinicians, get them engaged and interested in what computing can do in the medical field. And all of a sudden, you kind of create these wonderful, well-rounded students who end up working across all levels of fields, both clinical and in the computer sciences uh, arena. She came and said, listen, I have a course. I have this course that I want to teach. I want to teach it with Sheffield. We need the HPC resource. Um, if you can handle that, what we will do is get the educational side off the ground. And what we decided was we were going to go into the public cloud. Um, the Chime 2 application was very friendly towards um, mass resources, didn't need anything very special, which was wonderful. And off we went to decide as a group to build a solution that not only could it run in the cloud and it could achieve this educational goal, but we realized that if we were successful, that this could just be reused again and again and again. So off we went. In June to September 2020, what we did was we built what's known as the minimum viable cluster environment. This is something that's kind of important that um, I want to stress up front, especially if anyone on, on this particular, um, watching this particular talk, is interested in doing any type of HPC project of any size, actually. And the first thing that you have to figure out is how, how, how much resource you actually need in order to achieve what you are after. For education, Thankfully, it's low, but as you progress into other things, and as I'll talk about later, um, building um, the minimal viable cluster environment is like paramount to getting anything going. So to do that, I refer to it as three semi-easy steps because I didn't do all of them. It was a group effort. As I said, oops, I accidentally left a thing there, but that's fine. The first step is obviously to collate and clean. Um, Chime 2 was a kind of a, a continuation of the Chime application uh, for microbiology. And um, it's been around for a long time and it had a history, which was great. It had been taught on HPC clusters, which was magnificent. Bringing all that information together, getting it all into one place and getting it cleaned out. And I will say this up front is the longest process at insert application here, insert workload here that you will undertake with trying to get anything transformed into high performance computing. Particularly interesting too, if you guys want to move that up into the exascale scheme. Then you go after that minimum viable cluster element, which is what are the fastest, cheapest resources needed to run the course. And this is kind of what you would refer to as a science experiment. You would put down exactly the types of resources you believe you need, and what most people do is they start with the last cluster it was run on or the last set of kit it was run on. Even if it's, yeah, I, I understand I'm saying this like as if people are all running on HPC. You might be looking at migrating from a laptop or a workstation towards HPC. So what do you have now? 
then working with ELSAs to figure out what we think will be the best way forward, and then picking a small segment of what you want to achieve or the critical segments of what you want to achieve, and running those segments until you can really understand, ah, here it is, this should be the sweet spot. That's in terms of the amount of time you need to spend um, and the amount of cost. Now with education, um, they had limited windows where they were working with students, so we had to be fairly quick when we were actually in the class itself, but the resources could change or swap out for those times in between so that you could actually save a little bit of money and people weren't as concerned about getting those results fast. And finally, it was about teaching the cohort. Uh, this The first round, which I'll talk about um, in detail in just a second, was I would probably say the most intense round in terms of how we approach this project. We were regularly meeting, we were regularly reviewing, we were regularly looking at every element of what was happening in order to make sure that when the cohort went live, that everybody was successful. And we could use that data to help feed a second cohort, which we call the hands-off cohort, where we're all kind of watching from a distance while uh, UCL and Sheffield got on with their way. Before I was, you know, if I could say it, releasing this course into the wild so that uh, they could take it to wherever they needed to go and go ahead and teach it. So I went through my mind about what I wanted to do to show how this all worked out. And I realized that um, we have this cloud usage chart. It's not very well marked, but it gives you an idea of how people interacted and how the, the cloud itself uh, came into play. So we've got our blue, which is the actual public cloud. In this case, it was AWS. Then red is us, that's Alice's flight. Then UCL, which is here and Sheffield, which is right down here, but then you'll notice they spike straight up into here because a lot of what Sheffield did or what they provided was the educational aspect. So in terms of things, um, everyone interacted at the times that we needed to interact. So let's go on and look at all these little time stoppers here, and tell you about each step of the process. So the collate and clean stage. That's happened from June and it kind of ended around August. It's the longest stage. The key things that I really wanted to point out here is that you see that the cloud usage actually doesn't ramp up very much, but that there is some kind of fiddling about in the front and then some spikes as you actually enter the course itself. And that's because this is all about getting, getting the information together. Uh, the data itself had to be pulled primarily from uh, UCL machines, but there was stuff lying around in other locations. Um, there had to be some normalizing of the data, making sure everything remained standard, made sure the application was running consistently before we moved on to the next stage, which was the minimum viable cluster stage. And if you look back here, that's the messy stage. You see these spikes that kind of happen, actually you see a drop in a spike, and that's because you, know, you start big. So the most powerful resources, is kind of the most money, the fastest time, and then we you slowly from there descend down into, okay, here is exactly what we can get away with before we go into the onboarding session, which is right there. You can see right before uh, Shellfield came on when we were just going uh, full out, trying to make sure everything was settled, and once everything was, everything dropped down in. So you got your minimum viable cluster build. The course live itself, and um, this is gonna come into play for lessons learned, really consisted of getting everyone onboarded, running that course, and this times in which the course was live, live. And then that I mean like you had the stuff happening here with the spikes that was happening down in the lower half, but the upper spikes here, this is when they were live teaching and they needed a, a cluster running and they needed the students to be onboarded and we needed to, to have the results happen fast. That followed by the end very easy to point out that eventually everyone starts rolling off, the students go away, um, we start getting the data out, the resources start ramping down, and eventually they disappear altogether, especially if you're rolling onto a different platform. So that's sort of the flow of how our project worked. But the biggest and most important bit that anyone I would say walking away with any knowledge about what happened was the roles people played were so incredibly important. Everyone within UCL, Sheffield, and ALSAs knew exactly the responsibilities we were undertaking. And had we not gone in with those clear intentions, as um, Andrea says, I don't think this would have worked. And why is that? 
Well, it's very simple. The, the simple aspect is, is that once you have that ownership, you can be successful. And that is when we took that HPC project and we went into medical school and it started to succeed. After that initial investment, we did this, the hands-off cohort. So what, what does that mean when I say, oh, we, the vendor went hands-off? It meant that we weren't as engaged on a project level. The first time around, we held weekly project meetings. We were constantly testing stuff. The second, we would meet periodically to make sure things actually happened exactly as they were expected the first time. And mercifully, it proved successful. And once it proved successful, we realized that in terms of a vendor side to things, we could actually step away. And now Comp Biomed and their partnership have this wonderful uh, piece of, of HPC, this environment, which they can then pick up and take to where they need to go. And since then, the class runs about two times a year. We've got about 30 students per course, and it has actually lived on AWS Azure, and I know that currently it's living on premise. So what benefits? What, what do we learn? Let's, let's uh, share this knowledge with you so that say you're on this call and you're trying to say, okay, I want to transform a project I have towards HPC. I want to teach someone some element of HPC. I want to try to see if something has uh, validity within uh, supercomputing. So here's what you need to do. Single application or really single workflow, single piece. The biggest thing that happens is people want to take the whole pie. They want to do everything all at once. They want to jump in and they want to get um, all of it completed. And I think why this project was so success successful and why other projects that um, aren't even related to Comp Biomed that we've worked on since have been successful is they focused on that simple one goal. And I think that when you try to complicate things out of the gate, you are inviting all level of pain into your life. The second thing was to centralize everything that you have into one location, or at least get that information in a, in a space where it can be looked at by all the parties that you have involved. And that's because you need to establish those team roles super, super early. Um, I said before, um, Andrea said it before, um, it wouldn't have succeeded really to know what everyone's job is, you're 75% of the way. So let's think about how it was split up for this particular project. So UCL primarily had all of the Chime data. It also had a couple of students who were dedicated to testing resources. Um, they had to write up the methodology. They had to make sure everything followed a clear process. And then that was supervised by Andrea. Sheffield held on pretty tight to the educational side, wanted to make sure that the students were brought in properly, that they were trained appropriately, that they had the right level of support wrapped around them so that even though that this whole thing was happening virtually that as these students came in and in this case they were all Sheffield medical students they would be completely encased in a proper education environment where they could ask questions where they could get the help they needed where they could understand the background behind what it is they were doing and when that came together it was great and underneath that that was ALSIS providing the resource so we made sure that they had those that HPC cluster was running at the scale that they needed it for the courses that it was downscaled to very affordable rates for when the students were just plugging in a bit of their data or if the um, course was not live and we were also making sure that nothing fell over. So once the testing was done, we were actually looking after it. And by looking after it too, we did actually have an outage. In fact, it's the only time I can think of, and I've worked on public cloud for seven years, where AWS actually fell over. Thankfully, it fell over out of the cohort, but that became our problem. That was not the problem of UCL. That was not the problem of Sheffield. It became the problem of the expert. Had the education side, had all the drives failed or something like that, then everyone knew where everyone needed to be so that when it came time to sitting with those students, they were getting the best possible. The investment side of this is something I know a lot of people will immediately say, okay, so usually they say how much money, but it's actually a time and cost balance. So 
what you want to do in order to get into some kind of project like this, this idea of portability or cloud native transition or running from a workstation um, you know, into a, an actual physical cluster, it really does come down to what kind of investment you're going to put in. So I thought up a couple of ways and to get to those ways, we have the base solution itself. So what did ELSAs provide? How did this all work? Um, and then I'm going to scale it back to what if you don't have the ability, uh, what if you do not have the availability of a vendor to that you have scored that grant? Now what do I do? So the Nucleus environment actually has a core. The centralized location in this case was the ELSA's Flight Center subscription. So we use that as a centralized hub to pull all of the data into so that everyone knew where everything belonged. So that's that center there. Um, this was all grabbed off the on-premises cluster. We were not linked to any on-premises cluster. I just sort of put a line here so that you understand that if necessary, we could have gone out to an on-premise cluster, but they fed that data in. And once they fed that data, in, we were able to build what we call a pre-production cloud environment, and in that pre-production cloud was where the minimum viable cluster came for. Then you have your production environment, so you've got your the least amount that you need and then the most amount that you need, where in that case it was AWS and Azure. And out of this, we also, and this was built because of the process, we started the ELSA's flight control thing. So we began to hand over the control of forecasting and launching clusters to the teachers themselves, but something that we could monitor within ELSA's flight center. There was also the service center portal. So in this case, uh, the UCL team, which we worked primarily with on the cluster side, could file cases, could file requests, could file notices, all of which fed in. So not only did you have the information on the cluster itself, you had everything that was going on with the cluster and over in the corner a forecasting tool and a launch tool was being built so that when the, the cluster was live you had small to medium and back again. There was a core infrastructure, very simple, login, gateway, head node, and admin. In this case we just used 10 compute nodes which we scaled up and down as the students needed them. There was never, in this case, and I and I do say to people as well, one of the reasons why I think this went well to start and has fed ALSIS flight and has fed many other projects going forward is, is that thankfully because this was an education project, it was easy to get a lot of people into what it meant to build an HPC environment and run an HPC environment so that they could actually go out and run even more complicated ones. The ALSIS methodology for writing anything for HPC has always been platform agnostic. So the difference of um, going to ELSIS instead of some other uh, group that calls themselves an HPC integrator is that we actually don't resell any hardware or public cloud time. Usually that is something that we might include as a package deal, but it's not something that we consider um, a big markup on our, our behalf. Um, in many cases, we will use uh, aggregators or resellers in order for, for that service to be provided. The idea behind how we design our platform as being agnostic is we know that things change. We know that um, systems get faster, uh, requirements get, diff uh, get altered, and that if we try to lock it into one particular platform, we're causing pain down the line. So the idea is that when we design anything, um, from the open source tools that I'll talk to you guys about in a second, all the way to if you decide to choose to use us, is that we think long-term, we don't think short, um, and everything that we provide to our customers, we hope we provide Provide it with that that you know we wrap it with that with the around the the knowledge that we want people to be able to use what we have transform what we have into something better um, down the line even if like in this case they um, UCL and Sheffield uh, even though it's been about a year year and a half since we've actively worked on this project it's still alive it's still going and that's how we like to see things because it means that what we've done is quality work. The uh, team at UCL worked very hard on containerization as well as alongside of uh, Stu and his team um, in product development to make sure that the, the workload could move around. And when 
when it, we when we released it off, as I, it's funny, I feel like I'm like letting letting an animal into the field. Um, when we released it back into the wild, we did so with the knowledge that for the next two three years, no incredibly significant work would need to happen in order to keep it going. Right now we get to the investment options. I keep the I jumping ahead today quite a bit. Um, so now this is exciting. Okay, this is great. Um, how do I approach a project like this from that time and investment um, standpoint or time? Yeah. So there is the time and money poor. Now I, I do say time and money more. I, I really should say time rich money poor side because as a lot of people are aware, there's a lot of software out there. There's a lot of tool sets out there. There are programs out there for you if you want to pursue anything on public cloud that you can put, if you put the time in, you would potentially get the grant to use the public cloud and you could get a hold of the open source tools. Um, one of the things that uh, I've thought about as well is that many universities, I know UCL has a, a big team and some other universities have a large team, is the research software engineering community. Um, the research software engineering group, are they exist, um, well, uh, they're like superheroes in my, in my mind because they are the bridge uh, between a researcher and, and building good code. And so if you're in a place where like, right, I've got time, I don't have a lot of money, where do I go? Uh, what I would tell you to do is pursue any public crown grant monies, uh, especially the fact that this is majority medical health and you could possibly uh, make a case for that with almost all major cloud uh, providers um, to secure some money there. Um, the open source to open source tool set, open flight HPC, which I'll show you in a second, um, is there to do the HPC environment build. It's what else is uses for everything. Again, platform agnostic. So you can take that away and do it as you will. And if you can get that RSE resource, if you can get someone assigned to your project to help make sure that what goes onto that environment is very good, stable code, then you're off and running. So open flight HPC is what we use to build the environment. Um, down here, I should also make sure that's in the notes at openflightHPC.org is where you can get a hold of our GitHub and all of our documentation. Um, we have, again, been utilizing, utilizing this tool set throughout the length and breadth. It's been developed over the entire existence of ALSYS, which is more than 15 years of building the right environments that work on your cluster. Uh, Elsa's Flight Solo is actually on AWS. So if you do get an AWS grant, here's a here's an even faster way to get involved. It's a, pre, a personal research environment. So it's I know this is terrible, and if any Elsa's employees are sitting on here, they're gonna they're gonna cringe when I say you know you do a survey. <laughs> it's basically what you're doing is you're choosing your resources, and then once those resources are chosen, um, thanks to Flight Solo, it'll put together your environment for you. You log in. Um, and a way you're running. So it'll be less about learning how to build the environment, more about pulling together an environment quickly so that you can get your workload running. Um, there are contents and tool sets, it's all included. Um, the help notes in there are actually robust enough that they can actually tell you what applications to put in. It's also configurable once you get in there. Um, and it's actually another offering that is in this case, it's something you can subscribe to or be a free part of, but it can also be part of managed services should you get investment and decide to use an integrator to help build your environment up. So let's say you're in the middle. And I would probably say in this case, I consider um, this project sort of like down down the line in terms of time and money. Um, mercifully, because of uh, where we were at the time in 2020, it was quite easy to get a lot of grant funding and resources in terms of um, investments outside. Also, um, and I and I have to be very clear up front is that we realized this was an opportunity as as a company to explore some tools that we wanted to actually see out in the in the wild. So everybody kind of put in a little bit of their own resources, but also um, an additional investment on top of that in order to get the proper outcome. So at that point in the game, say you do get a hold of some funds, utilizing any type of integrator, or any type of uh, resource provider who can help you build up stuff that you're not good. At. So um, the UCL team was very good at Chime, not so much at building an HPC environment, you know, bringing those kind of resources together, that's where the investment is worthwhile. Um, 
the public cloud uh, grant monies can do that. Many public clouds will actually be very excited that if you say, I give X amount, they will also match that. So it's another way of kind of growing up maybe a resource that you thought was really small into something that's larger. And finally, um, having a dedicated resource. And I know, um, I, I mean, I've, I'm gonna go back to the roles thing. Having someone own a project, you know, this is like X part of their salary or X part of whatever it is they're, they're getting funding for results in producing the end, you know, you need to produce that, that project means that there is a higher likelihood that the idea, which is great, will actually turn into something on the other side. And so when you start thinking about, okay, well, where do I invest? So in the case of Nucleus, the year one investment was here and here with all of this attached on. So we have the flight center, um, that central little dot when I showed you back how we built this all up with flight control to manage the cost and all of the content. Now this part here, you'll see it all break away. This is all of our open source and then our plug into the gateway appliance. Remember how I said very early on in the talk that people were having issues with accessing and getting everyone aligned so that you could get access to the resource you need. So this was year one invest this was year two. They went down to the simple prepackaged stuff that they needed. And what we, I, I do jokingly say, and we left a plug, we left, we, we left a cable there so that if and when the Nucleus environment needs to be relaunched on, with another application or another project and they need the investment and they actually need us to come on board, we're happy to be there. But until then, they're free to use all of our open source terminology because what they did first was they put up the investment, winded down the investment over time, and that looks a little something like this. And again, I have to say, middle of the road, because at the time and um, where we were, we could get a hold of matching grants and a few other things that really dropped the cost down. So you kind of see how it just kind of progressively goes down over time. So it was an upfront cost, yes, but then after that, the investment lives on. It does come down to time. I know I realized I didn't actually put in here, you know, the Sheffield and UCL teams, but the short of it is, is that they put in that effort, all the way, all that work happened, and now they're reaping the benefits of the other side. So what do you get with an additional value when you go ahead and invest? It's the idea of bringing in the right experts. Um, I don't, I think it's very important, especially because of uh, the drive for X scale that needs to happen within this community, that you try not to do all the things. And having um, the environment creation expertise was what we could give to this particular community so that they could succeed. We also have a lot of optimization and contain, we have experts on the ground who are able to get in there and take something that's good and make it better. This, um, really is a lot of the space that the research software engineers work in, um, less so here. So the, there are ways that you can move around in the space. And then we were able to give them that controlled forecast and, and testing that isn't something which surprises me, but then doesn't, that um, public cloud doesn't really provide in a way that can help people, especially when you're like, I've got X grant that I'm supposed to spend on cloud. How do I prove it? How do I make sure that I've asked for enough money? What do I do if I have money left over? And those are the types of things that we provided as vendors in this particular case. So let's just say you get a, you score a grant. Well done you. And you are really going to take whatever it is and you're going to transform it into high performance computing. Then obviously, of course, I'd love it if you chose us. But the biggest thing that I've actually want to add on top of this is the environmental impact, which I know everyone has always talked about as well, but now is your chance, as well as putting more ownership onto the project itself. And that's because not only are people really looking at these cloud native solutions, usually someone says, I want to transform this into something that's a bit more cloud native or portable or something, but then they say, and, I'm very concerned about the green aspect. I'm very concerned about how this impacts energy consumption. And there are um, there are up and coming, and it's unfortunately um, not, we. I would say we're working with someone, uh, we're at the group over in Sweden, that 
there are a lot of data center and actually the UK everywhere are starting to look at how do we uh, bring up the green credentials? How do we ask, you know, how do we optimize the code for um, better power efficiency? So there's all different angles you can look at this. And if you are um, lucky, to get the type of funding that you need to not only transform your stuff but go one better, I would absolutely say look at where the data, where you're doing the work. Is your data center green? Look at what the code is like. Can you work with some a group that specializes specifically in um, the efficiency of the code to the point to where you can actually get the idea about energy consumption? And that's the kind of stuff I think, especially as we move towards you know you guys going into the exascale uh, levels, that you can go in feeling a bit more confident because you've been able to go through the whole process and you've been able to look at the power side of this as well so that as things progress forward your project gets bigger it goes from this tiny little thing like chime 2 to the larger um, models of the human body that i know um, the teams are after that you have taken those small incremental steps along the way so that once you're knocking at the door you are better for it so what's the don'ts? Please do not try to do this all yourself. Um, I cannot stress enough how important it is to make sure you know the strengths and weaknesses of your team and where you need the help. And I mean, yes, okay, as a vendor, I could immediately launch into a pitch on this, but the fact of the matter is, is that when you don't have the right people involved with the right skills, you are setting yourself up for a potential disaster. I think the other thing is uh, don't think short term. Um, when it's it's a terrible thing to put in there to sit and go, well, that's great, but what's it going to be like in five years or three years or whatever it needs to happen? And making your solution too bespoke, making sure it has to live on only one system, that ties you into having to stay there. What if that system moves? What if the people change out? What if they decide that the next version of that system is going to be completely different? So keeping yourself in mind, what, where am I strongest? How can I make this last? And how can I make sure that as it, that, that not only does it last, but that it can last beyond me? is really, really important. And yes, that might mean that the initial investment might be high in terms of the time and the money that you put in, but it pays off in spades long term. So there's some resources that I'm going to put up in, or I'm going to have um, Gavin and Tim put into the notes. Um, there is an abstract on how Nucleus impacted education in HPC. We also have like a high level success story for those who are a bit more interested in, you know, what the impact was overall. Um, and there's also a complete project video, which I actually found this morning, which I was really happy because I thought it disappeared, which actually goes into minute detail on exactly how everything was tested out with in terms of building up the clusters. And that'll be uh, located on Confinement eSeminar number 30. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. And I'm supposing Tim's going to join because we're going to do questions. And yes, that is correct. That. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Kristen. Um, just a reminder for the audience that if you do have any questions, then uh, please navigate to the Ask the Staff a Question panel, um, which should be accessible by the question mark icon on your screen. Uh, it should look like this being uh, displayed on the slide currently. Um, you can go ahead and type your questions in there um, so that I can read them out to Kristen for you. Um, so, you know, whilst uh, you guys all have a, an opportunity to gather your thoughts, um, Kristen, I actually had a few questions of my own for you, if that's all right. Ooh, all right, fire um, away. <laughs> so, as you're well aware, Comp Biomed has a vested interest in code scalability, right? Um, so I was wondering, uh, particularly as the complexity of our codes increases um, and also with the push towards the exascale, um, you know, how can we ensure that best uh, design practices remain at the forefront? And furthermore, um, you know, is there some sort of feedback loop in place that allows us to constantly evolve those practices if they become outdated or redundant? Yes, and I I um, really should talk about there's there's things that are beyond me. There's like I said, there's many many components. As an exascale, there are many many components in making something successful. And I think, especially as you guys work on a lot of transformational work, which is really where this this community is right now, is that you get clued into people like the Software Sustainability Institute. Um, they are massive on coding best practices on uh, reviewing code to make sure that it is following a path where it can actually be transformed over time. So um, 
a uh, shout out to those guys because them, the SSI Institute has very much um, been a key factor in many projects that I know being successful ones. Um, it's nice to build the environment and see them run so smoothly uh, because of those types of things. I think the other thing too is remaining connected into the communities that you're interested in. Um, the uh, ISC conference is happening in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, there's the SC conference that happens in the US this year is Denver um, and opportunities to attend attend those things either in person or virtually, I think is a really good way to learn more about the community and the goals and also an opportunity to feed your ideas into that community. Um, there is also um, ancillary support groups, RSE uh, UK, uh, so Research Software Engineering UK, that group, um, those are active memberships as well as um, people who can just sign up and get the general newsletters. So you can know what the research software community is up to in terms of how they are translating requirements, um, how they're keeping abreast of uh, different technologies that come in. Uh, women in HPC, uh, WHPC, uh, it is not just for women. Uh, we, uh, I'm part of that group and we do um, a lot of stuff around uh, skills, uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, I know that because most of your work is medical, uh, there is a lot to be said about ethics. And when you run that right alongside a lot of the work that women in HPC are doing about diversifying uh, the workforce in technology, um, surprisingly a high amount to that is transferable into how you view what you're doing with your particular projects. Super, thank, thank you. you. Um, yes, I do actually. So, um, in the context <laughs> of uh, project management, um, what sorts of considerations need to be taken into account by, say, a group that's interested in a project that is portable and or educational? Um, for example, who needs to be, uh, who needs to be involved um, and what sort of level of real-time commitment would be necessary uh, to put something like that into place? So commitment for time. So when you're looking at a project like this and you're thinking, okay, right, I want to do it, um, it goes down to that ownership thing that I've really kind of stressed on. I, being a project manager uh, for this project as well as several others, um, I kind of held that ball in my hands um, and said, right, you know, I'm going to make sure these tasks are pulled together. And if you are starting out and you are taking that ownership, I'm going to say, please give yourself the grace of time to learn how to put those kind of things together in a way that works for you. There are tools out there um, that are great. Uh, explore the wonders of a Gantt chart, explore the wonders of things like Trello, um, what is the Kanban? That's the one I think that you can get off GitHub. There is various ways that you can monitor things uh, to make sure that uh, a project is seen to the end. Um, the biggest thing too is that when people come together, as long as everyone knows the task they need to achieve and I mean, really, when you're holding the role of project manager or project leader, um, it becomes a lot less about the technology itself when you're the leader. It becomes far more about making sure people know where they fit within the project itself and that they that their importance, which everyone is. I mean, I this would not have succeeded, absolutely bar none, without every single person on the team. And, you know, I've listed the main people for UCL and Sheffield and Elsa's, but there's countless people underneath that were digging things out, that were finding bugs, that were fixing issues, that were raising questions. And we were also really lucky that the students gave us so much feedback. And that's the thing, you gotta be open to, to learning from your mistakes. You gotta be open to um, being joyful for when you do succeed. And I think that level of investment really starts when you make that decision that you will own it or a person in your team says, right, I own this, I'm going to see it through. Sure, sure. Yeah, I've, I've actually only just discovered productivity, to, uh, productivity <laughs> tools such as Trello, Monday.com, that sort of thing quite recently. Yeah. Um, so it's funny you mentioned that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I've actually got an audience question for you. Um, and that is, does, this, uh, does the solution work with private clouds? For example, OpenStack um, cloud hosted in a university, for example. Yes. Um, so the, the, the private cloud, it's interesting. I have been on the cloud journey. I was, I was brought into high performance computing at the start 
of the cloud journey back when it was, you know, every, I don't know if any, I'm, I'm going to date myself with the whole sharks and jets and everyone standing on one side, uh, shaking their jazz hands at each other going hardware, and the other person on the other side going cloud. And, you know, and it was who was going to win, who's going to win. And it moved into the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that there are tool sets uh, such as OpenStack that have wonderful transferability between uh, private cloud and there's public cloud aspects and there's hardware aspects. And so, yes, absolutely, this type of thing can run on a private cloud system. Um, you know, Alsys, we've, we're currently developing our own uh, private cloud solution. We're looking at ways, and, and I think this talks about like the future and you think about the future of this project itself and how, um, they want to teach more people. They want to bring more people in. A private cloud has to be one of those uh, tools that they use in order to get this message out there. Um, and this is the same for us as vendors. Uh, being able to offer people multiple platforms to solve their problems is very, very important. And yes, of course, we develop on OpenStack and we're very much into open source tool sets um, towards building that agnostic methodology. Perfect. I mean, I, I, I uh, definitely enjoyed the um, West Side Story reference. <laughs> um, so um, I've got one more question of my own. Um, so I suppose this is you know, um, one last opportunity for the audience to submit some questions before I draw the session to a close whilst uh, Kristen is answering this question. Um, so, and this is a bit more general, is have there been any unexpected spin outs resulting from Nucleus? Uh, for example, have these methodologies proved useful outside of the original use case? Absolutely. I'm the, if you want to say something, I'm very, very proud of this project. You know, why, why would I, um, and I was talking um, this morning with Gavin, who, who runs a lot of these boards, it's like, why would I agree to talk about something I haven't touched in a year and a half? And that's because of the benefits that came out of this were so many. So let's, let's talk about the fact that we have flight control now. Um, so when it originally started out, we uh, had them put in requests to spin up their cluster environment from the minimum viable to a full scale production environment for the students to work in. And we quickly learned out that, you know, if you need these kind of things last minute, it was, you know, it was going to be detrimental. These kids weren't going to be taught. They weren't going to get what they needed. What if they needed resources? And so because of that, we were able to develop an entire tool set that now our customers use in order to forecast and request resources in ways where they don't need someone behind the machine, you know, putting everything together to make it happen. So that was one of the things. The second thing that came out of it was the method of, or excuse me, the process. And one of the things, and I'm sure there's probably people on this uh, listening now, they may have pre or post uh, AI or ML processing that they might need to do because those two fields are merging together. And we worked on a lot of AI projects around um, looking at uh, scans, uh, so CT scans, that happened almost right after this one came to a close. And in, in those cases, because we had gone through um, that period of gathering information that I could tell people up front, right, you're gonna need to spend some time with your data. And this is gonna be the longest part. And But once you get it right, you're flying. And it was true because once you put that effort in and you get your data lined up and you get your, your resources lined up and you get your workflow running the way you want it to, it is surprising how fast it goes. And being able to set that expectation and be able to tell people, this is what you need to expect, it really takes a lot of the pressure off because I know there's so many people out there that really want to get something done and then they get frustrated because, oh, you know, setting it up is taking a while. Well, if you're new to this, it is going to take some time, but it goes so much faster once you just suffer. It's, I, I, I shouldn't say suffer. Once you go through the process of, of accepting <laughs> those things into your life, I think the other thing that I've seen come out of this, um, I don't even know if Andrea is on this call, but I've, I'm putting more words into her mouth. Um, the multiple degree types coming out now. So, you know, uh, I'm a bit jealous, I must admit, um, that people can go in now and get access to these resources. And we're starting to see people come out with them a bit more of a mixed degree type. They may be medical and they're also uh, computational. And it's these like wonderful, I, I wouldn't say it was unexpected. I think it was part of her master plan, but, but being able to actually see these people starting to graduate out now and 
explore these worlds from uh, different angles, I think it's wonderful because of this need to move into exascale in order to do the level of processing you're after. You can't come at this with just one train of thought. It's these wonderful kind of overlaps that you see within the skills that I think is what's going to make um, the next stage of these projects within Comp Biomed and beyond Comp Biomed a success. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, the fact that you've seen all of these additional successes, right, it really seems to be testament to all of that work that was put in up front that you were talking mm -hmm. about earlier. Um, but yeah. no, that's brilliant to hear. Um, now, there haven't been any other questions um, coming from the audience. So um, with that being the case, I'm thinking that maybe this would be a good point to start drawing the session to a close. Um, so if you wouldn't mind going over to the next slide for me, please, Kristen. Um, so just a quick reminder to everyone that this e-seminar um, was recorded. So it's going to be available um, on the Comp Biomed YouTube channel and website, which uh, you can access via the link that's being shown on screen currently. Um, and then one final thing before we uh, wrap up is I just wanted to take a moment to plug Comp Biomed's free scalability service, which is very much on brand <laughs> for this talk. Um, so if you're someone that uses or even develops biomedical applications that necessitate intensive computation, um, but you're running into some performance issues that are limiting the scope of your research, then Comp Biomed offers a service completely free of charge uh, to improve the turnaround of your computing jobs. Next slide, please. Um, so if this is something that applies to you and your research, then you can go ahead and fill out an application form available on the web page that's displayed at the top of the screen. Um, but otherwise, please feel free to reach out either at the email address shown here um, or via the In Silico World Slack channel. Next slide, please. Um, so, In Silico World is a community devoted exclusively to In Silico medicine, um, offering expertise, opportunities for collaboration, um, and a safe space to exchange ideas and advice. Already, In Silico World has a large following, including members from uh, large, uh, next slide, sorry, um, including members from large biomedical companies, biomedical SMEs, independent software vendors, clinical research institutions, and even regulatory and standardization bodies such as the FDA and NICE. Um, so that's all that I wanted to say about that. Um, thank you once again, Kristen, um, so very much for giving us your time today. Uh, and finally, thank you to everyone in the audience for attending, and I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, guys. And I've just popped up my uh, email address if anyone has any other questions. Perfect. Thanks, Kristen.